Hello everyone, my name is Ben Eady. I'm the online media manager of ModernAnalyst.com, the premier online community for business analysts. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar titled Thorny Issues in Software Requirements. Today's featured speakers are Carl Wiegers and Franklin Carr, and this webinar will last approximately 60 minutes, including the Q&A session. So make sure to submit your questions in advance using the questions feature of the webinar software. I'd like to say thank you to iRise for sponsoring this event, and at this time, I'll turn it over to Franklin to get us started. Thank you, Ben, and welcome everyone to the webinar. My name is Franklin Carr, and I'm a senior manager with the event sponsor, iRise. Successful software development depends on effective communications across a diverse set of team members and stakeholders. And too many teams are still relying on static documents, diagrams, and click-through prototypes. But for today's rich, interactive applications, these, de these deliverables just aren't enough. For over a decade, iRise has been helping businesses around the world solve issues with application definition and requirement solicitation. Customers use our innovative, patented, drag-and-drop solution to create realistic simulations of web, desktop, and even mobile applications. iRise simulations allow stakeholders to see, interact, and test a proposed solution before a single line of code is written. In addition to simulation capabilities, our interactive and collaborative platform will integrate with other solutions you may use to drive your SDLC, such as requirements management, QA, and testing platforms. iRise also gives you the ability to generate UI code directly from simulations effectively guiding your teams from concept to launch. Now in conjunction with Modern Analyst, I'm pleased to introduce your speaker today, Carl Wiegers. Thank you, Franklin. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. I've been interested in software requirements for more than 25 years, and people sometimes ask me questions about requirements for which there is no simple solution that you can always apply in every situation. I've also found that there are certain topics in the requirements domain that cause, cause chronic confusion for business analysts and other practitioners. So today I want to talk about some of these common challenging areas or thorny issues that people encounter when dealing with requirements on their projects. I can't give you the correct answer for a lot of these questions because there isn't one for some of them. But I can give you ways to think about the most appropriate thing to do in various project situations. Uh, much of the information I'll be presenting here today is drawn from the book shown here, More About Software Requirements, Thorny Issues, and Practical Advice. So here's a bit of information about me, and uh, I'd like to invite you to visit my website, processimpacts.com, where you can get a lot more information uh, about uh, various topics. There's a bunch of my articles out there. I have a bunch of templates, checklists, information about training materials, and other resources for requirements engineering and for other software topics. I might mention that I'm currently writing a third edition of my book, Software Requirements, the uh, leftmost book shown here, uh, which will be published later this year by Microsoft Press. So this slide shows some of my other books on various topics. The one on the right is interesting. My first non-technical book was published in 2011. That's a memoir of life lessons called Pearls from Sand, How Small Encounters Lead to Powerful Lessons. So it's rather different from my software work, although some of the things I've learned from software feed into some of those lessons as well. So let's dive into our first thorny issue. People often ask me, well, how detailed do our requirements need to be? And as usual in software development, the answer to this question is, it depends. And really, I don't even know exactly how you measure detail. But the central question to consider when you're deciding how detailed to make your requirements is really, who do you want to have making decisions about the requirement specifics and when? If you're willing to defer many of the ultimate decisions about product capabilities and characteristics to developers, then you don't need to include as much detail in the requirements documentation. However, if you want to ensure that you get exactly what you expect, you should have more comprehensive specifications. Now, don't expect that even the best written requirement specification can or should replace human dialogue we're always going to have to have conversations. But uh, still, I think that uh, a lot of merit, a lot of value comes from creating some kind of a group memory that the various project stakeholders can look at. So let me show you some of the factors that might feed into your decision about whether you should put more detail into the, your software requirement specification, your SRS, or conditions that suggest maybe it's OK to include less detail than you might otherwise. So let's think about the things that mean maybe you don't need to be massively detailed. If you have extensive customer involvement, uh, you know, I have on-site customers that are actually sitting down and available uh, on a moment's notice to developers to get questions resolved and fill in the blanks and make choices, 
then you don't need to put as much detail in your written specifications. If you've got developers with a lot of domain experience, people who have worked in the same area for many years perhaps, they pretty well understand what they're doing and you don't need to, to fill in every little uh, iota of information. If you're building something for which a precedent is available, perhaps an uh, existing system that you're re-engineering or similar products that you're building on or maybe a, uh, the next member of a growing uh, product line, next family member, then perhaps you don't need to specify as much detail. But let's be careful here. Uh, sometimes people have different ideas of what an existing system does. I saw a, an interesting example of that once with a client of mine. They were building version N of, uh, uh, well, let's say it's version N plus one of their current main product. Okay, So version N was their current product, and they were working on the requirements for version N plus one. So they said, oh, great, uh, let's go back and look at the requirements for version N and see what it says. So it said version N shall be uh, the same as version N minus 1, that is the previous version, except for the following changes and, and additions. Hmm. Well, that wasn't very helpful because it doesn't tell you much about what you started with. So they went back and it said, all the way back, it just said, hey, the next version should do the same thing as the last version except for these changes. And they went clear back to the beginning and never found a requirement specification. So at some point, people actually have to do glean this information from the product, and that's a little risky. If you're going to be using a package solution for a portion of the, the needs in, in, that you're building, then there's no point in putting in all the detail about what the package will do. You, you want to maybe use uh, use cases or something like that and the quality attributes and business rules as part of your specifications to make sure that whatever package we choose will, in fact, let people do what they need to do and align with our business constraints. But there's no point in specifying all the detail that the package already uh, has in it. Now, on, there are other conditions in which you might want to put in more detail than average. If you're outsourcing development, then you don't have the opportunity for day-to-day -day communications to fill in the blanks. So you'd better write that information down. And even if you're not outsourcing, but your team is geographically dispersed, you still need to have this collected group memory where people can go back and understand the decisions that were made and, and get those details, because otherwise they're not going to have the same sets of understanding and assumptions. If you're doing testing based on requirements, which I think is an excellent idea, you need enough detail so people can conceive the tests that will flesh out the expected behavior of the product under various conditions. If you have to produce accurate estimates for the project, you need more information. If you have a vague, fuzzy idea of what you're doing, you're going to have a vague, fuzzy estimate, too. So we need to have a little more detail there. And if you have to do requirements traceability, uh, which is often required for life-critical products that require certification, such as medical devices or aviation products, um, then you need to be able to demonstrate to a certifier that, yes, in fact, you have implemented all of your requirements, and here are the chunks of code that uh, implement them, and here's the tests that verify them, well, you certainly need enough detail in the requirements to be able to tie those threads together. So a specification is never going to contain all of the requirements information for a project, but there are two things that make me particularly nervous when I hear about them. Those are implied requirements and assumed requirements. We always have some, but there's risk there because your assumptions may be different from mine and your expectations may be different from mine, so watch out for those areas. Now, one of the biggest complaints I hear from business analysts is that their customers give them solutions, not needs. So this points out that another common problem area deals with distinguishing requirements from design. And people sometimes say, well, requirements are about what and design is about how. But it's not that simple. It's not a simple matter of what versus how. Really, it's kind of a stack of what's and how's, the what at one level is addressed by the how at the next level of abstraction down. Let me show you what I mean. Let's think in terms of a scale of decreasing abstraction. So if at the top of the list we're talking about very broad kinds of things, like why are we undertaking the project? What are our business objectives? So if we say the what is the business objectives, then we ask ourselves, OK, how are we going to satisfy those business objectives? We go down a level, and we think about, well, what will the user be able to do with the product? And that's where we start thinking about use cases and stories and scenarios. So now we have a new what. So the how here that addressed our business objectives has now become a what at a lower level of abstraction. So we say, OK, if that's our what, then, then what is our, our how that goes along with that? And the how that we address 
uh, the user being able to do things is to describe what the developer is actually going to build, the features we're going to implement, or the specific functional requirements, or the product characteristics and non-functional requirements and quality attributes. And that in itself goes on down the chain. So you can see that this is really a stack of related what's and how's, because now we have to think about how do we uh, implement functionality. Well, we start talking about system components and architectures and how the pieces fit together in their interfaces. That goes on down into the behavior of the individual components. So we talk about more detailed design or class design, databases, and so forth. And ultimately, we actually implement each of these components, at which point we're talking about algorithms and user interface control details and things like that. So you see it's really not just uh, requirements are what and design is how. It's really a very gray, fuzzy area. And a lot of times when you're talking about requirements, it's valuable to take a tentative step into the solution space and think about, well, how might we satisfy this requirement? Perhaps you build a prototype or you do some simulation. And those are excellent ways to then verify and, and validate your understanding of the requirements by thinking about how you might implement it and seeing if that is meeting the expectations of people. So let me just give you a little way to think about this. Let's do a little, uh, yeah, an exercise here that I'll just let you do on your own. We're not going to have you, uh, you know, show your responses or anything. But let's look at a single requirement statement here and then think about how some details of that might be requirement or might be design. Think about a home alarm system, okay? And we have a requirement in our specification that says something like, when the alarm system is armed and a sensor is triggered, the user shall be able to enter a numeric passcode to disarm the system. Okay, so that's our broad requirement. And I think that makes sense as a requirement, but let's see how some details that we might come up with as we thought about that through our project lifecycle, how those might uh, turn out. So what I'd like you to do, I'm going to show you five statements here, and I would like each of you to then ask yourself, is that a requirement or is that design? So just make a little note to yourself of what your opinion is, and then I'll tell you what I think at the end. So let's say we have a more detailed requirement. The system shall provide feedback as the user enters the passcode. Do you think that's a requirement or do you think that's design? Just make a note. Here's another one. The system shall sound an audible tone after the user enters each digit of the passcode. Does that strike you as a requirement? Or do you think we're getting into design now? Third one, the system shall sound a tone of 1,000 hertz at a volume of 75 decibels for half a second after the user enters each digit of the passcode. Well, that's getting pretty specific. You think that's a requirement? Or are we getting into design again? How about this one? The system shall contain an audio signal generator capable of producing constant tones ranging from blah, 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 frequency and volume. Okay, so now we're talking about some specifics about that uh, audio signal. Requirement or design? And finally, the system shall contain a one-inch speaker with a frequency range of 80 to 8,000 hertz. can handle power input from half a watt to three watts. All right, again, requirement or design? Now clearly these statements are moving from high level requirement concepts down to detailed design decisions, but it's not totally clear cut at which point you would say, oh, that's a requirement and now all of a sudden it's design. It's gray. So here are my answers. I think the first one is clearly a requirement. That's a more detailed child requirement about the alarm system. And really a way to ask yourself is a requirement to design is to think, can I imagine more than one way I might fulfill that, that statement? And if the answer is yes, then it's probably a requirement. Now the second one is a requirement but with a design constraint because now we know that the feedback is an audible tone as opposed to a flashing light or tactile feedback or something else you might imagine. The third one is a requirement, but with a more stringent design constraint. Not only is it an audible tone, but we've described exactly what kind of tone that should be. And the bottom two, I would say, are clearly more uh, design. But you see this kind of sequence of a thought process of, of evolving over the course of the project shows I think there's a gray transitional area between requirements and design, not a sharp, clean boundary. So another question that often comes up is, all right, I've got this piece of information that could logically go more than one place in my specification. Um, should I put it both places? In other words, should I duplicate it or should I not duplicate it? Hmm. Well, this is one of those things for which there's no single correct answer. 
there's advantages to duplicating the information. You know, it keeps everything the reader needs to know in one place. That's certainly convenient. Kind of encapsulates a chunk of work that you can then deliver to somebody and off they go and, and work on it. But this also generates some risk. It increases the chance of generating an inconsistency if you modify some of the instances of that piece of duplicated information, but maybe not all of the instances. You might not even know where all of the instances are. So if you're just focusing on a particular chunk of the product and you see that there's a requirement you need to change, you might not even know that that same requirement is supposed to appear several other places and they all have to be changed at the same time. Now you've got an inconsistency and that's guaranteed to cause headaches later down the road. So there's really no perfect answer to this question of whether or not to duplicate requirements information. There's no perfect technique for handling it. Another place this arises is if you're interested in requirements reuse. Should I copy the requirement in from its original source and then do I have to worry about making changes and then inconsistencies being created? Or should I just point to it, but if anybody changes the original, that changes mine, which maybe I don't want. So now you have to try to deal with different versions of the requirements, some of which you can change, some of which maybe you cannot. So this gets tricky. So in general, I prefer not duplicating information. I prefer you know, incorporating uh, reused content or, or duplicate content by reference. So you store it in one place, you point to it from other relevant places. And there's various ways we might do that. Um, suppose you've got your requirements in a Word document, as many people do. Uh, there's a cross-referencing feature in Word that you can use so that you have some, some statement, let's say a requirement that you want to uh, replicate elsewhere. You can actually insert a cross-reference back to the master instance of it so that any time that master changes, it just gets mirrored and echoed wherever else you would put in this cross-reference. So you haven't actually pasted in the text. You simply pointed back to the original. That keeps them concurrent. Um, one thing I don't see done nearly as much as I think we could benefit from is using hyperlinks in documents. So suppose you've got a, a glossary. Maybe you've built a, an enterprise level glossary of common terms that are used throughout projects you folks work on. And you want to then have a glossary of, of terms so people who are reading your requirements back for your new project can quickly go get those definitions. Use hyperlinks to point to exactly where the information is, the destination information. So you're actually duplicating a link, but you're not duplicating the original source. If you're using a requirements management tool, then you can use traceability links in those to connect logical information here, which facilitates reuse and facilitates the integrity of the information. I saw a great example of the problem from duplication once uh, when I was reviewing some requirement specs for a client. They had written some use case descriptions and one of the sections of their use case template was for business rules. So they actually put the text of the relevant business rules right embedded into the, uh, the template description for each of their uh, use cases to which that rule applied. All right, seems convenient because now the use case is all packaged up with all the information right there and that's great. but in two of the uh, use cases I reviewed, they had the same business rule, which was phrased you know, identically, so that's good. And then there were two other use cases that had a rule that looked to be basically the same. I think they were trying to say the same thing. So the second two were identical, but they were a little bit different from the first pair. And so if you're reading that, it immediately raises the question, gee, are these the same or not? And you're going to have to go trace that information and get that answer down. If you were to just have a reference to another source where your business rules live, and I just follow the link to business rule number 23, then that's always current and we always get the same information. So I think those pointers are a better way to deal with it. All right, another thorny issue deals with sign-off or approval of some body of requirements. Many organizations do use some kind of a sign-off, a formal sign-off or approval process, but a lot of times it's not totally clear what sign-off means. And incidentally, I've always wondered, why do we not sign on to the requirements rather than signing off on them? But that's neither here nor there. Now, sometimes sign-off doesn't mean anything. It's an empty ritual without it being clear as to what people are really saying with their signature. And if you ask, say, a project sponsor or a senior manager, well, what what did the sign-off mean when you signed on it? What were you thinking that, that meant? They might say, well, you know, I didn't have time to read all those requirements. I was given a piece of paper with my name typed on it and a line above my name, and so I signed on the line because otherwise nobody writes code. But I didn't 
have time to read those, and I didn't really understand it all. I, I trusted you, but you let me down. And those are not fun conversations to have. But if you do have some kind of a sign-off process that you use, I think it's a very good idea to reach an agreement in your organization of exactly what the implications of that step are. And I know some people have actually taken some text that says, this is what it means, and they put it right on the document so we all understand what we're saying there. So here's a suggestion of what sign-off maybe should really mean. It's an agreement. It says, first of all, I agree that this document, and it doesn't have to be a document. It could be information stored in a database or something. But I agree that this document represents our best understanding of the requirements for this release today and that the system described will satisfy our needs as we currently understand them. But there's more. I further agree to make future changes in this baseline through the project's defined change process. Sure, change happens. We don't want to stifle change, but we want to make sure we make the right changes in a controlled way so everyone knows what's going on. And here's the part everybody hates. I realize that approved changes might require us to renegotiate the cost, resource, and schedule commitments of this project. Everyone wants change to be free, but it's not. That's just the way it is. So I think it's a good idea to come up with some description like this that's suitable for your environment and actually write it down so that people know just exactly what they're saying with their signature. Now, even on an Agile project, you have to have an understanding of the agreed upon contents of a specific iteration and the implications of reaching that agreement. It's really not the sign-off itself. It's the agreement on a baseline of the contents for a given chunk of work. And I want to read you a little quote here. This is from a consultant named Nanette Brown, who I think had a beautiful uh, statement about what sign-off might mean in an Agile environment. So I just want to read you what she said here. She said, even in an Agile environment, the concept of sign-off can fill a valid function. Agile tells us to embrace change, but the concept of change only exists with respect to a reference point. That's what I call the baseline. And she says, even within a team where there is close communication, people can have different interpretations of current plans and status. One person's change can be what another person thought was already agreed to. However, if you position a sign-off as a lightweight ceremony acknowledging, acknowledging that we are here, I think it's fine, says Nanette. Just because we are here today, she says, doesn't mean we can't be somewhere else tomorrow, but at least it ensures a common understanding and point of reference. So I think she really nailed the essence of, of what reaching that agreement is all about. People often complain about their projects suffering from scope creep, and I suspect all of you have had that kind of experience at some point. But sometimes the scope for a release or an iteration isn't clearly defined and communicated. So how do you even know you're suffering from scope creep if we never really explicitly agreed on what scope is? So the project scope describes the portion of the ultimate product vision that the current project or iteration will address. It defines the boundary between what's in and what's out for a specific product release or iteration. And when I started looking into this a few years ago, I found that even though everybody talks about scope, there really wasn't much said about, well, how do you represent that? So I want to uh, talk about a little, uh, a little bit about this scope issue. Um, first of all, we do need to define what some portion of the product will and won't do. That's the essence of scope, what's in, what's out. This lets us uh, start making realistic project commitments. The project manager can begin assessing what resources and time they're needing to get the job done, and that allows the manager to make realistically achievable commitments. So the project manager therefore knows where the boundary lies for their responsibilities on the project. Without understanding scope, it's really hard to prioritize and do release planning so that we can have a sense of, of exactly what's going to go into this chunk of work. Um, we need to be able to have some reference point to facilitate change decisions. We need to have an understanding of scope so that if someone comes up with some new request, we can decide which proposed changes to approve and which release to allocate them to. And this really helps manage scope creep, which is the uncontrolled growth of scope that leads to so many problems and so many projects. So it turns out that there are several ways you can represent scope. And I want to just share some quick examples of those with you. These three I want to talk about briefly are the context diagram, the use case diagram, and something I think is quite cool called a feature roadmap. The context diagram is a, is a very old 
example of an analysis model. They've been around for decades, and they work just fine. I think practically every project can benefit from having a context diagram. The notations are very simple. If you're familiar with data flow diagrams, this is basically the very, very top level, sometimes called the minus one level, of a data flow diagram. So uh, we start with a circle, which is the name of our system in the middle. And here, as an example, I'll use something called the cafeteria ordering system that I, I use as an illustration for a lot of these things. And we don't know anything about the internals of our system. Okay, So that red circle represents our system boundary between what's in and what's out. So outside that, we have these rectangles that represent external entities, sometimes called terminators, which are entities outside of our system that somehow interact with the system. So those are things that are out, not in. And uh, connecting those, we have these arrows. These arrows are called flows. And you label them, showing some things, some information, some control, some, something that communicates from the outside to the inside. It could even be something physical, if uh, you consider part of your system to involve manual physical operations. So here, for example, if we look at the patron, this would be a person who wishes to order a meal from the cafeteria ordering system. Uh, one of the thing they, things that they can do shows the arrow coming from the patron down into the cafeteria ordering system. They can submit a meal order and changes to that meal order. And the cafeteria ordering system might send a menu out to the patron so they can make those, those uh, orders. So you can see how these uh, arrows kind of represent, at a very, very high level of abstraction, a dialogue that can take place between something outside the system and the internals of the system. So this is a way to show what's out and what's in. Um, because suppose somebody is looking at this picture and they say, wait a minute, I thought the cafeteria inventory system, shown at the bottom there, was supposed to be part of the cafeteria ordering system. In other words, they think that uh, box that's now outside belongs inside. Well, that has a pretty big scope implication, so let's make sure we agree on those things. Kind of a little bit related to the uh, context diagram is a use case diagram. And here's a portion of the use case diagram for the cafeteria ordering system, showing some of the use cases that, that actors outside the system could initiate and how other actors participate. Now here, instead of having a red circle as our system boundary, we've got a square box. It doesn't have to be red. That's OK. It's just a box. Things outside are not part of your system, but they inter interconnect to it in some way. Things inside the system are part of it. Now, unlike the context diagram, the use case diagram shows us things outside as well as inside. So we have the little stick figures that represent those things outside, which are called actors. And we will see many of the same ones that were on the context diagram, like patrons. And now we have a little bit of visibility into what's going on inside our system boundary. So we have these use cases shown in ovals. And one thing a patron might want to do is browse a menu. So that arrow from the patron to browse menu is not a flow of information going back and forth the way we showed on a context diagram. Instead, it's just showing that the, the patron can initiate this use case called browse menu. But other actors might participate in, in uh, certain use cases as well. For example, the patron might want to order a meal, another good use case. But in order to complete the processing of this order a meal, then there's another actor involved who's called the order processor. And that arrow going out doesn't, again, inform indicate information moving. It just says, hey, the order processor is what's called a secondary actor that's participating in, in the use case. So we can see this network of connections between actors outside the system and uh, use cases inside the system so you know who can do what and how the pieces all fit together. So this gives us a little bit more visibility inside our system boundary, but you can still see what's outside as well. Now, another technique that I think is pretty cool uh, deals with features. This is a feature level analysis. So suppose your, uh, your system is going to have uh, eight features, whatever you call, you decided to call a feature, and you're planning to deliver this system over a series of four iterations or releases. You've also identified uh, each feature as having several levels of enrichment. Okay? So each release is going to implement certain portions of each feature or of certain features. And maybe you're going to enhance a feature in a later release that got a, you got to start on in an earlier one. In other words, you don't think of the features as monolithic, but rather they're subdivided into smaller chunks. Basically, this is the difference between stories and epics, okay, where you've broken something down into smaller stories that you can then implement over a series of uh, iterations. So here's a way to think about it. Here's our, our features, cleverly titled F1 through F8. And here are the levels of each feature, okay, which is just an increasing richness of functionality. 
and we've shown either four or five enrichment levels. And there's nothing special about that four or five. I'm just using that as an example. Now, it turns out that features two, five, six, and seven, I've grayed out the top boxes here. They only have four feature levels. The others all have five. So here's how we're going to uh, use this for planning what goes into each release. Maybe for release one in blue, we see that these levels of certain features are our plans for implementing release one. In other words, we're going to fully implement whatever feature one is, all five levels. We're going to do the first two levels of level three, first three levels of feature, I'm sorry, the first two levels of feature three, the first three levels of feature four, and we're just going to get a start on feature five. So this is a visual depiction of the scope for our first release. You can see exactly what chunks of functionality we're planning to put into that release. Now release two is going to be shown in orange, and here what we're doing is we're getting a start on feature F2. We're completing the implementation of F3 by adding those three additional feature levels, not doing anything else on F4 right now, and we're doing something more on F5, and we're implementing all of feature seven, because it only had four levels. And you do the same sort of thing for release three and release four, just kind of filling in the grid. And the boxes don't represent anything. They don't imply they're all the same size or anything. They're just saying, visually, here's a map that says, here's how we want to approach building our product over a series of releases. Well, I think this is kind of a cool technique. You can kind of show the same thing in the form of a table. So I call this a feature roadmap. So here you might list several features that we want to implement, and there are things you might expect for a cafeteria ordering system. You know, create the menus, order meals, maybe order meals from restaurants, not just your corporate cafeteria, uh, request meal delivery, and so forth. And then you can show very concisely over the series of releases what we plan to do. So we want to release or implement in the first release everything we know about menus. Okay, that's got to be fully implemented, and then we're done with it. Uh, and then other features like ordering meals from the cafeteria are going to grow over time. We start with kind of a basic implementation in release three, add some capabilities in release two. I'm sorry, let me try that again. We start with some basic capabilities in release one. We add some capabilities in release two, and then perhaps complete the implementation in release three. Other things like ordering meals from restaurants, we're going to wait on. We're not going to do anything on that in the first two releases, and then we're going to implement that for the third release. So this is a visual way, again, to concisely show the scope of what we're intending to put into each release, what's in, what's out. So you might consider using these techniques on, on your project. Now, I want to shift gears just a little bit here. When we talk about writing requirements, I think we naturally think in terms of natural language text. But I want you to rephrase the term writing requirements to mean something a little different. I want you to think of that as meaning really representing requirements knowledge. Okay, So we're not just writing requirements. We want to think about different ways to, com to communicate with people, because that's what requirements are all about. So we want to choose appropriate views of the requirements that will let people uh, who are maybe learn and understand in different ways, get the information they, they need. So there are a lot of different ways to do it. Certainly natural language text is by far the most common, but sometimes we're better off showing visual models, diagrams such as a context diagram or many other kinds of pictures that we can draw. We might use a decision table or decision tree to communicate something about logic. Uh, test cases are an alternative view. It's a way of thinking about not what to build, but how to tell if what we built is working as we expect it to. We might build prototypes and screen designs to give us another view, starting move, moving more toward you know, the reality of what we're building. Tables and lists are often more effective ways to communicate than just long sets of functional requirements that look very much alike. We have a whole notation available called mathematics that we can use for formulas and computations. The data dictionary tells us something about the data that's glued gluing all of our functionality together. Uh, why not put a photograph or an audio clip right into your requirement spec? Those are all things that we can do now. Uh, so the skillful analyst will think about the most appropriate way to represent a particular piece of requirements information and communicate that to the audience. Different audiences sometimes demand different views or different levels of detail, and natural language text often is not the best way. So let me give you a couple of examples of how this can be valuable. Uh, complex Boolean logic offers many opportunities for ambiguities and missing requirements. And here's a sample requirement that's uh, written out in text that kind of illustrates this problem. So let me just read this to you. It says, if an order is placed for a chemical to a vendor, okay, so now this is a different system, not the cafeteria, but rather a chemical tracking system, let's say. 
So if an order is placed for a chemical to a vendor, the system shall check to see if there are any other pending orders for that same chemical. If there are, the system shall display the vendor name, catalog number, and the name of the person who placed those previous orders. If the user wishes to contact any person who places a previous order, the system shall allow the user to send that person an email message. All right, so there's a lot of stuff going on in this big, long requirement. It's kind of hard to read. It ought to be split out into separate requirements. And if you write requirements in this style, it's hard to see if all the outcomes of all of these if-then branches are being specified. And else conditions are often overlooked. So here's an alternative way we might choose to represent those uh, kind of logical things using a decision tree. A decision table is another way. But a decision tree like this, it's really just a flow chart, would immediately reveal that we have some problems. So here's, here's how we would show this in a decision tree. First question, is the order to a vendor? If yes, then we ask, are there any other pending orders? And then if yes, we say, OK, do you want to contact a previous requester? And if yes, then we send an email. So that's actually, I think, a visual way to show precisely what this text is showing. But there's some gaps. What if the answer to any of these questions was no? That requirement did not specify what happens here. Okay? So these, these false outcomes are, are, are totally implicit. Now, implicitly, maybe the reader will conclude that the system should do nothing if these ifs are no, but that's an assumption being forced on you by the incompleteness. And I don't really like assumptions and, and implicit stuff. I like explicit stuff. So here's another way we can look at this. This is from an actual requirement specification. There was this long table. This is for a real-time machine of some kind, which is why they talk about firmware. It's a machine that can be in various states. And there was this big, long table that I've just condensed here that described the states the system could be in and the way it could change from one state to another. I've kept the description here for just one state, which is called running. And this tells you a little bit about how we could get there and where we could go. So it says the firmware enters the running state on request of the host, blah, blah, blah. Uh, other places you could go to from there. And you know, so here's the description of what's happening. And it was kind of tedious to read all of these descriptions and try to figure out how the system behaves. It was also hard to tell if all of the expected state changes and system behaviors and exceptions were addressed. So can you think of a better way to communicate this information to the reader? I thought of one. I drew a picture. I'm a big fan of drawing pictures to, to help um, get a high level, higher abstraction view of these things. So this example is a state transition diagram. It shows the possible states the system could be in, one in each box, and the allowed transitions between those states shown in arrows. You can also use an, a UML state machine or state chart diagram to serve the same kind of purpose. So I read through that big, long table describing all these things, and I tried to pull away, away from the details to step back to this higher level and just show how we could move from one state to another. And, and this makes sense, OK? I, I could kind of get a high-level picture of how this works. But I found a couple of problems that uh, I wanted to call out. First of all, I could see no requirement that described how the system gets back to being off. Nothing said how to turn the machine off. So there's possibly a missing requirement that went from the shutdown state to the off state. Also, it occurred to me that maybe there should be some way that we should consider the possibility of getting into the error state while running. In other words, maybe something could go wrong and we end up in an error state. And that was not addressed anywhere in the requirements. So I think it's important to draw these kinds of pictures as an analysis tool to be able to step back from the details and see if there are missing or inconsistent requirements from, from something like this. Um, it's a very good way to catch ambiguities and gaps in your knowledge. All right, another thing we have to talk about are non-functional requirements. Uh, non-functional requirements are often neglected or get very short treatment in the requirement specifications that I review. People naturally focus on functionality. But a lot of times, non-functional requirements make a system that make the difference between a system that just does what it's supposed to do versus a system that users actually find acceptable and enjoyable and efficient to use. So there are several categories of non-functional requirements. Sometimes people equate these with the so-called illities okay, of quality attributes. But there are other categories as well. One category are design and implementation constraints. We also have external interface requirements that describe connections between our system and other software applications or hardware components or users. User interfaces are, are important. 
and uh, communication protocols that we're going to have to be using. Performance is one of the categories that people are pretty likely to be talking about, but performance is more than just response time. It also deals with throughput and capacity and latency if we're in a real-time environment and how the system is going to function in degraded modes if, if it gets uh, one more user than is intended, for example, what happens. Uh, and then we do have these quality attributes. They're often called the illities because so many of them end in I-L-I-T-Y. But as we see here, they don't all, and robustness is an example of one that's not an efficiency. But I think it's really important to talk about quality attributes as a, as a core part of your requirements uh, elicitation, because otherwise it's very, very expensive or maybe even impossible to sort of build these characteristics in later after you've got the functionality in place. They have to be in place from the very beginning. And that's an issue with Agile projects because while you can add functionality a chunk at a time over the life of the project, you really have to be uh, clear about the quality characteristics from the very beginning. So what are we going to do with this information? Well, this slide indicates the likely categories of technical information that different types of quality attributes will generate and well, what that turns into then. And so I have, uh, for example, some certain kinds of quality attributes, integrity and security and usability. Those might actually lead the business analyst to derive certain functionality that we can then implement in order to achieve the quality characteristic described. Other attributes, such as availability or performance, lead more to system architecture decisions. Some attributes, interoperability and usability, impose design constraints that the developer has to work within, and so forth. So I think there's a lot of reasons this information is important, and I really encourage you to focus on quality and other uh, non-functional requirements if that's not something you currently do in your projects. All right, the last topic I want to address here is some issues around use cases and stories and scenarios. You know, I, I really do like these things. I like use cases a lot. Um, you don't have to go down to the nth level of detail when specifying a use case. But the idea of focusing on not what the product uh, is going to do, in other words, not its features, but rather what users will be able to do with the product. A usage-centric approach to requirements elicitation, I think, is, is a much better approach in most cases. So here are some quick definitions. A use case is a description of a set of interaction sequences, that is, a dialogue, that a system performs to provide some outcome that's, that provides value to one or more external actors. If it doesn't provide value, then it's really not a use case. And that's why, for example, I don't consider logging in to a system to be a use case. Nobody just logs in and says, hey, that was great, and walks away. They log in because then they want to do something that actually does provide value. A scenario is maybe one specific path through a use case, or maybe a story you tell about a, a specific instance of a use case execution, maybe identifying actual users and specific data to kind of make it more real. A use case covers a whole range of possible scenarios. And here's the definition from Mike Cohn about a user story. A user story describes functionality that will be valuable to either a user or purchaser of a system or software. And of course, user stories are heavily agile development. But really, user stories, to me, are just kind of the, the very top level statement of a use case or a portion of a use case. So I think there's a, a lot of uh, connections there. So a lot of this boils down to abstraction again. Suppose we have a company called Postal Delight that handles all of your shipping needs. So let's consider the act of preparing a mailing label for a customer's package. Okay? We can imagine a set of scenarios that cover a spectrum of abstraction. The most abstract one, that is, the one that covers the, the widest range of possibilities, is called prepare a mailing label. And that's a good name for a use case. It would encompass any conceivable package that a customer might want to ship, any combination of origin and destination locations, and all variations of shipping methods, prices, allowed and non-allowed items, and all that. So prepare a mailing label is the broadest in scope, and so that's called, uh, you know, that's, that's the most abstract, and, and that's a good example of a use case. Now, if you slide down the scale a little bit, we might have a scenario that covers a, a particular uh, shipping method. You might say, oh, I want to prepare a mailing label to send a package by second day UPS. You know, maybe that's a, a particular uh, a aspect of preparing a mailing label that involves certain information. So that's a little bit more specific. And if you go down to the other end, we get a little story about a particular customer with a particular need. 
Uh, Chris wants to send a two and a half pound package by second day UPS from Portland, Oregon to Rochester, New York. She wants it insured for $75. She wants a return receipt and the package is marked fragile. So that's a very real instance of preparing a mailing label um, for that kind of transaction. So uh, when you're listing requirements, you can start with a use case and then like prepare a mailing label and try to learn everything there is to know about it. Or you can start with some scenarios to give me an example of uh, you know, what was the last thing that happened uh, when somebody came in to order a package. You might ask the postal delight person, tell me about that experience so we can generalize from that to slide up the abstraction scale. And I think business analysts have to be very skilled at sliding up and down that abstraction scale. The ability to kind of judge when do we take a big picture approach, when do we drill down. So one of the problem areas, one of the thorny issues we run into is the relationship between use cases and functional requirements. Some methodologists regard use cases as being the functional requirements. And so they don't think you need to have a functional requirements list or a software requirements specification. But I've seen many, many organizations get into trouble when they relied only on use cases to represent their requirements. Gave them the, the general idea to the developers, but there were a lot of uh, questions because there was a lot of information missing. So that's one school of thought. Use cases are the functional requirements. The way I think about it is that use cases are a valuable tool to reveal the functional requirements. They help me understand what people need to do and what we have to, to build to let that happen. So there's these two different perspectives here. There's the user view that says, uh, OK, we, we know what, what use cases we need to perform. And then the BA has to go through the process of saying, how do I turn that into enough detail and enough specifics that developers can say, yes, I can build that now. Now, if you don't write out the requirements for that translation, you're just relying on developers to derive that all correctly on the fly. So I employ user requirements in the form of use cases to understand the user's needs so we can then tell developers what to build. Sometimes a use case or a story is enough information. Sometimes it's not. So another reason why I think it's useful to distinguish use cases from functional requirements is because the way the information is organized in an SRS and use cases is quite different. A use case has a bunch of little packages of information. We have preconditions, a description of the normal flow. We might have some alternatives, alternative flows, and possibly some exceptions of things that could go wrong. We have post conditions, business rules, and other information. So you have these little packets of information. The SRS is typically organized in a more hierarchical fashion with logically related pieces of information grouped together. So for example, a developer might like to see a statement from the normal flow of something that happens, and then right with that, a description of the exceptions we're going to have to be able to handle instead of having to piece all this together from the chunks of a use case. So the information in a use case can get sprinkled throughout the SRS in a variety of ways. And I think organizing it from the use cases into an SRS structure um, is actually value added for the developer. So there's a thought process you have to go through um, of, of how the BA would examine the various parts of a use case description and try to derive the functional requirements that need to be implemented. And some of these are obvious, others not so much. Use cases have preconditions that state uh, what, what has to be true before we can carry out the use case. So that means we need to build some functionality to test each precondition and perhaps more importantly, the use case never tells us, well, what if that precondition isn't satisfied? What should we do? So somebody has to figure out, uh, like if the, if the user's trying to uh, you know, register for payroll deduction so they can buy food from the corporate cafeteria, what if they're not, what if they're not registered? Um, do we then uh, allow them to register at that time so they can place their order or, or what? So, so we have to add some value by thinking about um, functionality to really handle all the parts of the use case. If you look at the dialogue steps in the use case, that's pretty straightforward as to what functionality will let the dialogue take place and where do we need to branch into alternative flows. Look at the exceptions. What could go wrong? How do we detect what went wrong? How do we recover from that or reset the system if we need to? We look at the post conditions, things that are true after the use case is successfully executed. How does the system satisfy these post conditions? And there might be some visible ones that the user will tell you about, but sometimes there's internal housekeeping uh, uh, post conditions that have to be satisfied that a user simply won't tell you. So really, I think the BA needs to go think through all that. We also need to look at the business rules and try to figure out, well, what functionality do we have to implement to enforce each business rule? 
So there's a thought process here that I think a lot of people struggle with a little bit. <clears throat> so I, I've had this very quick survey through some things that I have found to be common problem areas uh, with people who are working in requirements. Uh, they're hard problems. There's not easy answers to a lot of these, but hopefully I've given you a few ideas about how to encounter some of these if you run into them on your own project. And the reason that I like to, to focus on dealing with these hard issues is because I want to avoid the unpleasant surprise factor that happens at the end of so many projects. Uh, my experience has been that surprises in software are rarely good news, and so if we can figure out ways to deal with some of these thorny issues that crop up time after time, maybe we can avoid some of that surprise factor. So I want to hand the uh, presentation now back to uh, Franklin from iRISE, and then we'll have some time for questions. Uh, thanks, Carl. <clears throat> Great presentation. A lot of uh, really, really good information in there. And I just want to touch quickly about how iRISE can support some of the concepts that you were talking about. And I think one of the most important things that came out of your presentation was uh, the level of ab abstraction in uh, requirements. So when we compare that to iRISE, um, where you're building a, a fully functional data-aware representation of, of a business system, as your abstraction decreases, the fidelity of the simulation or the amount of information, uh, the user interface, the business rules that you build into it is going to increase. And so they really do work hand in hand and it's a really great way to think of iRISE as just being another one of those multiple requirements views that you mentioned earlier in your presentation. So when we, we look at that multiple requirements view, one of the things that iRISE allows users to do is actually simulate a full user experience not just a click through or not just a uh, screenshot, but it literally allows people to start interactive, interacting with the requirements from a very low fidelity level where we may just have two or three fields on a screen to an extremely high fidelity level where we actually have uh, sample data and business rules built in. And because it is a collaborative platform, it allows multiple parties to actually validate that the requirement or the solution is going to meet the business needs. So it's not just your business stakeholders or your business partners that you're going to be communicating with. Your development teams, your architecture teams, your testing teams also have the ability to have the same view. Uh, and when you do that, you're allowed to actually generate consensus across your teams in a collaborative environment. You are not sending back hundreds of emails back and forth. You don't have red line documents. Uh, you have a repository of comments linked to specific elements of a system. And you're able to get rid of a lot of those surprises that you mentioned very early in the life cycle. Um, and by doing that and utilizing iRISE, it will give you a much more precise estimation of your project resources, the project timeline, and eventually the overall project costs. And what our clients are seeing is that they're seeing on average a 30% decrease in their project costs because they're able to make sure that the requirements that they're coding off of are correct. Um, and from that, we can also generate your functional specifications. Uh, we can do that via a Word document or via an API to get them in any format that your company uses. And we can also integrate directly into a requirements management system because we are firm believer, believers that once you elicit a requirement, you need to manage that requirement through the process, especially through any changes that come in later in the life cycle. If you build your simulations to a very high fidelity level, you actually have the ability to uh, generate code directly from the simulation. So you could generate your front end code, allowing your developers to just focus on the back end code and the hooks to your data system that would speed up your development process. And another thing that our customers are actually seeing is an increased user adoption. So by simulating requirements and then incorporating all of the concepts that you talked about today, uh, the, the actual project that's delivered at the end meets people's needs and we've seen user adoption shoot through the roof, much less compa complaints, you have a lot less change requests and, and that results in multiple or less versions of a software uh, release. And the majority of the surprises that we tend to catch now in user accepting testing can actually be gathered very, very early in the life cycle. So, um, that's really how iRISE can support what we talked about today. And at this point, I would like to open uh, up the question and answer session. For those of you that do not know, there is a questions panel in your meeting. Uh, on the meeting panel on the right-hand side of your screen, you can enter your questions there. And we will uh, get through as many of them as possible in the seven minutes that we have relate, uh, 
remaining. So the first question, Carl, is uh, actually a very specific requirements question on how to document requirements for a BI project, things like reports and cubes, to ensure that you're not leading the document to a particular product. Well, unfortunately, that's a question I can't really answer because I don't know anything about business intelligence projects. <laughs> so I'm not even going to try to take a stab at that. Perhaps you've got some thoughts on that. Well, do, do you think if you kept it really at the high level kind of uh, features and capability levels that you could provide to certain vendors to make sure they meet that, that that would uh, help steer it away from a certain project or a certain product? Well, yeah, I think any time you, you write requirements in a form that you can imagine more than one solution, where you can say, oh yes, this, uh, you know, this is the capability we need, but there are multiple ways that could be done, uh, then that, that means you're not painting yourself into an overly constrained corner. And, and this is really what we're talking about is constraints. You know, if you write the requirements in a way that points you to an existing commercial solution, then obviously what you're doing is imposing constraints that only one product can satisfy. And there's a real risk with imposing excessive, unnecessary, inappropriate, or premature constraints on a project because it means you may not then uh, consider alternatives that would perhaps give you a, a better solution. Uh, so that would be the thing I would look for, say, can, can we imagine more than one way we might meet this? And sometimes you can't. Sometimes you just need something very specific. So there's nothing wrong with imposing constraints. Just make sure the right people do them for the right reasons. Great. Roseanne, I hope that uh, helped clarify your question. Um, Carl, the next question is actually regarding uh, sign-off that you had on slide nine. Uh, someone was asking for uh, who the quote was that you, you read. The quote was from a woman named Nanette Brown, N-A-N-E-T-T, -T, last name is Brown. I actually knew Nanette a little bit uh, when I did some work at Pitney Bowes. She's a consultant now, and uh, I just thought that was a, a really brilliant way to encapsulate um, the, uh, the essence of baselining, signing off, reaching agreement on uh, in an, an agile project. You know, sometimes, and this is something I always find frustrating, is that whenever some new technical approach comes along, a new methodology, then people sort of throw out everything else they know as being evil, bad, obsolete, and, and no good. And that's ridiculous. What you think to do is, is realize there's some, a lot of timeless concepts and practices that need to be thoughtfully adapted to new situations. And I think she really uh, helped uh, craft that in a way that um, people can say, oh, yeah, I, I can see how that would work in, in this new environment. Great. The next question actually is, uh, actually, the next few questions actually revolve around uh, the level of the features that you discussed earlier. And Tatiana wants to know what you really mean by the level of a feature. And then Matthew wants to build on that uh, by asking, um, when you are laying out the levels of feature, does that imply that all of the work is understood prior to beginning? Um, and in essence, it would be a waterfall process for feature levels, feature roadmap in particular. Okay, both good questions. So what I mean by feature levels is imagine a product that has some, some features, some capabilities, and you can think of, you don't necessarily need to implement it all at once. You can grow the capability over time. So here's an example. Suppose you've got an anti-malware product, okay? That's your product, and it's got a, uh, you know, antivirus uh, capability, of course. And you might think in terms of updating virus signatures as being a feature. So maybe in the first version, you get uh, you know, a standard set of, of virus signatures um, if when you install it, and that's what you have. But then a higher feature level would be that you can manually uh, download uh, you know, an updated virus, antivirus signature. Uh, a third feature level might be that at some fixed time, interval, your, your antivirus software will go out and, and check the, the home base and, and download the latest signature uh, file. A fourth might be that you um, also can upload or download um, new engines, okay, for the antivirus engine if that's necessary. And a fourth or fifth level might be that it can push out to the, the client uh, an updated signature when there's an emergency patch needed. Okay, so that's just an example, maybe not a great example, but you can see how there's, you might implement one of those or two of those now and then implement richer capabilities later and maybe you don't even know what those later capabilities are going to be all on day one. So that's what I mean by feature levels. Um, so how does that relate to waterfall? Well, it's really a level of detail. Uh, in other words, what I just told you 
is nowhere near enough requirements information for someone to go out and implement any of those. But it does give you a path that you can follow. You can say, generally speaking, here's our vision of where our product is going. Here's how we've subdivided that vision into some chunks of capability and prioritize those so we know which ones we want to try to do earlier, which ones can wait. And then you need to group those earlier ones into the contents for a, a, the fut soon future iterations and group other ones into the uh, contents of, of later iterations. Um, so you can certainly implement this incrementally. And you don't also need to detail the requirements for those all at the beginning. But you do need broad strokes. You have to have some idea of where you're going. Otherwise, you could end up with a checkbook balancing program instead of an antivirus program if you don't know where you're going. So I think starting with those broad strokes, and then the phrase I like to use is progressive refinement of details so that you can elaborate the, the requirements from that higher level understanding into an appropriately detailed level of understanding at the right time. So the classic waterfall approach would say, oh, let's pin down all the requirements for all of these feature levels, for all of our features, and then we'll go in to start thinking about design. And that's not at all what we're talking about. What we're talking about is having enough idea of what you have in mind to build a strategy and to do some early prioritization, and then f refining the details to whatever level is necessary at the right time of your life. Great. Um, Matthew would like to know, how do you avoid becoming a requirements document janitor? Well, if I knew what that meant, I suppose it would be easier to answer the question. Uh, I, um, I, I don't know what that means. I, I think he, he's referencing, how do you avoid spending all of your time just really cleaning up the requirements document? Well, you have to realize you're never going to get perfect requirements. Your goal, from a practical point of view, is to get requirements that are good enough to allow construction of the next chunk of your project to proceed at an acceptable level of risk. And the risk that we're concerned about to do excessive, unnecessary rework um, because we didn't understand things well enough and we missed the mark. So that's really our, our target, is to get requirements that are good enough to proceed. And uh, if you get caught up in analysis paralysis trying to perfect your requirements, you'll never build any software. OK, okay. I think that's. Uh we're all the time we really have. I hate to cut you guys off, but uh, um, we do try to keep it right within the hour. So I'd like to say thank you to Carl and Franklin for a very informative presentation, and thank you everyone for attending today's Modern Analyst webinar. I wanted to point out the webinar, along with the slides, will be archived at modernanalyst.com within a few days. This concludes today's event, and we hope you have a great day. Thanks. Bye.